the crowd is getting uneasy. They've walked a long way to present their complaints to Nicholas II on a cold January morning, and in all this snow too. The Winter Palace is certainly earning its name. At least the soldiers lined up across the way seem better off. Their boots don't have so many holes. The priest is leading songs, which helps to keep people warm, and their voices are heard. That's the important thing. But this is their third rendition of God Save the Tsar. Surely he knows they're here. Why won't he come out? Why won't he listen? Someone gives the order and the soldiers open fire, advancing on the gathered workers. The peaceful gathering turns to chaos, confusion and screams. Hundreds of people begging for better lives are left with their blood on the snow that morning. The Tsar wasn't even there. This massacre on the 9th of January 1905 is now called Bloody Sunday, and it makes up the second movement of Dmitry Shostakovich's haunting 11th symphony. Sometimes classical music is detached from reality, an abstract thing in and of itself. When it does tell a story, it tends to indulge in poetry or mythology, in fiction. But with this work, Shostakovich grabs you by the shoulders and turns you to look head on into real, concrete brutality. How close it is to you, how swift, orderly and merciless it is, carried out by servants of the state, carried out by your countrymen. Hearing the relentless climax of this movement can turn your stomach as though you were really there, watching armed horsemen trample people fleeing in horror. How did Shostakovich do this with an orchestra? How can music show us a massacre? Just as important as the horrible climax of this movement is the music leading up to it. The 11th symphony is a long work, about an hour, and the violence of Bloody Sunday takes place nearly at the halfway point of the piece. Shostakovich spends most of the first 20 minutes in a quiet, cold adagio, subtitled The Palace Square, setting the scene for what is to come. Occasional folk songs in the woodwinds are interwoven with open chords in the strings, like distant sounds drifting over still winter air. The atmosphere is calm, but empty, apprehensive. The start of the second movement, the 9th of January, gathers energy as it depicts the workers coming together and marching to the Winter Palace. While their cries for justice get more insistent, they are met with no response, the orchestra always returning to that bleak winter landscape. Shostakovich understood the importance of powerful contrast. By always calibrating our ears back to the calm and quietude of the opening adagio, he ensures that the speed and fury of the violence to come is as shocking and frightening as possible. The people are gathered across from the line of soldiers. Someone gives the order. A stern snare drum announces the beginning of the violence. It's hard to misinterpret. You can hear the triplet figure clearly imitating the rattling of a semi-automatic rifle. Notice the call and response between the snare rhythm and the strings just below it in the score. Musically, these ideas are designed to interlock. The frantic motif in the strings is not separate from the snare drum gunfire, but a direct reaction to it. Shostakovich is using rhythm to make this association crystal clear, and it gives us no uncertainty as to what this idea in the strings could mean. What else does a crowd do when soldiers open fire? They run. 
The rifle fire snare triggers a panic that swells through the string section, from the cellos and contrabasses all the way up through the violins. This one idea, we can call it the panic motive, spreads from instrument to instrument up the ensemble, eventually spilling over into the wind section as well. We hear it over and over, rising higher and higher through the orchestra. Shostakovich is using the form of fugue, one musical idea strictly repeated by different voices in turn, to show us the panic spreading through the crowd. Normally when we think of fugues we might think of Bach, the master of musical order. Instead, Shostakovich is using that strict order to depict confusion and chaos. The organization of the violence is exactly what he wants us to notice. Any memory of Bach turns bitter when listening to the master of musical irony. After experiencing the rushing panic of the crowd, the brass begins to bear down forcefully on the strings. When the snare drum interlocks with the panic motif here, the trombones and horns are pushing right behind it, spurring it along, sharp and dangerous. The frightened strings don't dare rest. Shostakovich is showing us another meaning of the word fugue, the word that comes from the older Italian fuga or fugere, literally to flee. They aren't able to flee far before the militant brass catch up even further. The short spurs from before are now swift, rushing crescendos, and where before they were pushing against the front of a fugue idea, they are now fully on top of it. We can both hear and see visually in the score how the forces of the Tsar are overtaking the panicking crowd. The chase continues for several more breakneck pages until the brass section has become a menacing, seasick glissando, swallowing everything up. They sound like approaching fighter planes, impossible to escape or overcome. The crowd has been surrounded. What were different fugue voices across the orchestra are now instruments united in terror. Their melodic line even tries to escape upward out of the music, only to be met by walls of brass tackling them back down. There is no way out. The entire orchestra is packed on top of each other, playing one frightened, hopeless rhythm. And with nowhere left to run, the snare drum resumes the slaughter. The murder culminates in a massive military chordal theme. The orchestra plays in lockstep, but the ends of their phrases are out of phase with the pulse, as if the violent monolith of sound that engulfs us does not share our worldview. This stretched time effect gives the relentless march of the Tsar's soldiers an absolutely nauseating power. The gunfire only stops when every last citizen has been silenced. Their pleas for justice are now ghostly memories. In the wake of massive tragedies, there is no alternative but to process events. They happened. What do we do with that? Sometimes it seems easier to pretend that they didn't happen at all, or that things weren't really as bad as they're made out to be. In other words, to deny reality. But truth-telling art like this movement from Shostakovich brings us back to the stark reality of such events with a plea. They were real. They were brutal. Remember them. While the Bloody Sunday Massacre is the massive focal point of this dark work, it is not the end of the story. This symphony, the year 1905, ends with a movement called Toxin, a word for a warning bell. One quoted song in this movement proclaims and foreshadows the 1917 revolution to come. Tremble, tyrants, as you mock us, threaten us with jail and manacles. We are free in spirit, even if our bodies are not. Shame on you, you tyrants. Shame. (laughs) 
Shostakovich's music gives us resilience. By remembering the horrors of the past, not as sanitized mythology, but in their real, terrible truth, we become better able to combat the terrors of our own time and place. His work is honest and, in its own way, hopeful. It is a lasting record not just of brutality, but how we should confront it head-on, unblinking, defiant.